But the wind had shifted. Across the land, a storm was brewing over communism. It would touch down in Peekskill, New York, at a Robeson concert. George Davis, one of the veterans who didn't like Robeson's politics and did live in Peekskill. There was a lot of animosity there. Uh, these veterans says, uh, you know, what are they trying to do to us? We, we helped win that war. 900 police, the largest concentration ever to guard the area around Peekskill, New York, converged to prevent a battle between war veterans and followers of Paul Robeson. The Negro baritone draws plenty of enthusiasm from the communistic faith. But on the other side are many more who believe in free democracy, and they spare no pains to show their disapproval of the red element. Cheers and catcalls greet the incoming commie contingent. And what the police did is they made the buses park Cross the road. They wouldn't let them go down into the picnic ground so that blacks getting out of the buses had to run the gauntlet of rocks, blows, and occasionally police clubs to get in. As they were about to start the concert, uh, the head of the security asked him, are you sure you want to sing because our guards have flushed out two snipers' nests on the hill overlooking where you're going to sing, overlooking the platform under a big oak tree? And he said, no, there are thousands of people here. I'll sing. They asked for volunteers to stand physically on the platform, big guys, between my father and the hill. So if there was a bullet, their bodies would take it. Men, the majority of whom happened to be white, just about came to blows over who was going to have this privilege. Finally, they had to draw straws. It was a lesson for me, let's say, in race relations. Here are white men how to come to blows to risk their lives for, for a black man who was my father. Those are the kind of lessons you always remember. All of a sudden, there was a quiet that laid over the field. You couldn't hear the helicopter. You couldn't hear it too much. And all you could hear coming from a microphone down in that field, maybe it was Howard Fast, he said, the real Americans are down here in this field today listening to this concert. It came over very clear. Not like that trash that's up on the road. Well. That more or less started things going because you had a bunch of hard-nosed combat veterans that was up there when we referred to as trash. When the music was all over, we started to go home. We did not know the trouble and the pain that was to come. The situation has gotten very tense, Sarah. Uh... And the cries from the mob outside were interesting. They went like Jews, commies, niggers, in various order, interchangeably. You got in, but you'll never get out alive. Everybody seemed to clash. Everybody seemed to clash. Around the corner was a guy with a pile of stones about waist high, and every car that came by, wham, at close range into that car. This black man was on the ground fairly badly beaten, and a GI in uniform, white GI, grabbed his arm and said, hey, no, that's not Robeson. That's not him. And the undying quote of this GI was, no, that's not the American way. You don't lynch the wrong nigger. But it saved the guy's life. Hold the line. Yes, hold the line. As we held the line at Peekskill, we will hold it everywhere. We will hold the line forever till there's freedom everywhere. Right there. You and me, we sweat and strain. Seeger wrote the song about Peekskill three weeks after Peekskill. Robeson, he still sang about the river, but the words were forever changed. You show a little grit. And you land in a jail. But I keep laughing instead of crying. I must keep fighting until I'm dying. And oh, I'm Come back to the fall of 1949, when China fell to the communists, 
or as Mao Zedong put it, when China stood up. Our world will continue with a crowded room in the fall of 49. Welcome back to the fall of 1949. The Yankees beat the Dodgers in the World Series that season, and the pennant races in both leagues went down to the very last day. And on that day, the editors of the August New York Times gave baseball precedence over the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Well, why not? The pennant races were still in doubt. The victory of the communists in China had been a foregone conclusion all year, ever since January, when the nationalists lost more than a half million men in one battle. On October 1st, in Peking's Tianmen Square, hundreds of thousands of Chinese attended ceremonies for the birth of a nation, the People's Republic of China, Communist China, Red China. Now a fact of life after a successful civil war against the Kuomintang or nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. The army parade came in for hours. The artillery, heavy tanks. You'd think the American army was marching in. American-born Dr. George Hattam, who had been with the communists for 13 years, was there that day. Mao said China now has stood up. That's a very strong statement. And he also said that uh, from now on, China is liberated. In 1946, Chiang Kai-shek, armed with more than 20 American-equipped divisions, had set out to rid China of the communists once and for all. After some initial success, the tide turned. The poorly armed guerrillas swarmed out of their strongholds in northern China, overrunning the Kuomintang troops. General Claire Chenault, one American who had stayed in China since World War II, tried to help. His widow, Anna Chenault. My husband, General Chenault, was operating the airline. We were trying to move people out. People were talking about maybe they would divide the country that uh, the communists would take the north and, and the Kuomintang would take the south, but that, that never did come about. U.S. diplomat John Melby watched the nationalists collapse. It was a whole civilization, a 2,000-year-old civilization, just crumbling, collapsing. Uh, everything in disorganization. China, in effect, had come to a halt. Ahead of the communist armies, as they moved slowly south, came the hordes of refugees. And I don't care who they are or where they are, all refugees look alike. They're all cold, sick, hungry, sparing. They don't know what they're doing, where they're going. They're just moving, crawling, slowly. One of the last Americans to leave Peking was another State Department employee, Howard Sollenberger who filmed these scenes with his home movie camera. Life was rarely this pleasant. Money was worthless. Inflation that uh, is hard for us to believe. When my wife had her 30th birthday, and I gave her a million dollars for her 30th birthday, well, this, this cost me about 40 US dollars to buy a million Chinese dollars. This was the exchange. We were preparing ourselves for a siege. We didn't know how long it would last. There had been a few American planes military attache planes that came into Peking towards the end. And one of the things I remember quite distinctly is the last plane that came in. Uh, the plane landed in the city on the old polo grounds uh, with the city wall in the background and the tower on the city wall. The last chance we had to get mail out to our relatives, people outside. A cloud of dust, of course, uh, rising as the, as the plane took off. And, that was it. You almost had to live there to know how corrupt a society could become. And of course, this is, uh, in a sense, one thing that led to the charge of so many foreign service officers who said, we're pro-communist. Well, they weren't in that sense, no. But most of them had been in North China. They'd seen the communists in operation. 
They knew that they were a dedicated group, that they were absolutely incorruptible, that they believed in something. 